morning and welcome to the fireside chat. Um, as you can see, we're sitting here around the campfire um, with a wonderful cacophony of bird noises as the sun goes down. I can hear Franklin's, pearl spotted owlets, lots of different birds around. But happy Father's Day, um, especially to everyone out there. Um, and I hope you guys have had a great day and spoiled your dad's rotten. So we asked a little question on uh, the afternoon sunset safari about which animal was probably the best uh, father in this area. And a couple of you got it right, but before we go into names, uh, we're going to show you the clip. And here is the clip. And it is... is uh, probably one of the only polygonous birds uh, that we get around here. So op opposite uh, to polygamy, um, and that is where, where the female will mate with multiple males. She will lay eggs and then disappear. The male will build the nest, he will raise the chicks, and quite often during the summer months, one of the really, really cute, um, cute sightings you can ever see is of a, a male jacana. quite often he'll sit there and he's got his wings over and you'll see these tiny little guys that he keep, keeps protected. So a male jacana, and um, quite a lot of you got it right, but the, um, the first people to get it right, um, well there was actually quite a few other animals that were mentioned, um, hippo, bullfrogs, which are, so, or are, which are also very good fathers, but not quite to the same degree. Jacana. A male ostrich is one that could compete with a, a male Jacana, but unfortunately he has help from the lady. So the people who got it right were Helen, Craig, Raisa, and Julia. Well done, guys. And I think I hear Commander Bond strolling in, trying to look quite suave, as he always does. Um, but it has been a really, really fantastic week. We have been really spoiled this week, so we're going to have quite a lot to chat about, and I hope you guys got your questions in, um, and we'll just wait for, oh, sorry, a bit of smoke there, uh, uh, Commander to join us, and we've got a special treat for you later as well. So, it has been an absolutely spectacular week, and we've got two really amazing sightings this week, and we will go into detail about them a little bit later. Uh, as we wait for Jemsey, but the birds are still going. The cacophony is not quite as loud as it was when we first went live. You can hear there's still forktail drongos making quite a lot of noise, hawking, catching that last insect before nighttime sets in. The Franklin seem to have calmed down now. Still a few off in the distance, but as you can see, there's a magnificent sky behind us uh, as the sun dips further below the horizon. It has been a really great day today in particular. Um, James, I know, has had some great time with those the Inkahuma Pride. And he got to walk them on foot, so I'm a little bit jealous of that. Um, as you know, um, we discussed on the Sunset Safari, probably one of my favorite things is tracking a cats on foot. Oh, hello. Hello. How are you? Welcome, Jamesy. Yes, thank you so much. How was your evening? Oh, it was marvelous. Hello, everybody. Oh, Here we go. I gave, you, I gave you the high seat. Thank you very much. Just Mendo. to make you feel a bit better. You're very considerate. Yes. Uh, only why sometimes. I like you. <laughs> so, wonderful afternoon so far. Yes, extremely pleasant afternoon. So, it has been. But now moving on to our fireside schedule, we the first of the really, really exciting sightings we had this week, I was lucky enough to, to be at. And no, we wasn't. got, yes you weren't, sorry, yes. I know you had mongoose poo, it's okay. Yes. Um, we were lucky enough to get a tip off from one of the other guides that there were cheetah tracks near the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. And we went into that area and as I looked at the ground and I saw the tracks, I sort of followed the line they were going and bang, there they were. Two male cheetah, but behaving really strangely. Um, 
And as you know, a lot of you will know, I've discussed quite in depth uh, the hyoid apparatus in cats. So cheetah are not able to make those loud noises by, like lions and leopards. Um, maybe James can do a cheetah growl impression for us. Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> but it is quite a strange sound. Um, so we found these two male cheetah and they were staring deep into a, a round leaf thicket, a round leaf teak thicket. Just and do going, a growl. I mean, you've oh. chosen. So not the most menacing sound in the bush and we couldn't figure out what was there and I remember mentioning I think there must be a hyena or possibly another predator and I was quite sure it wasn't a lion because if it had been a lion I think those cheetahs would not have hung around at all. Mm. But uh, and then the young quarantine male leopard burst from said round leaf teak and sent the cheetah rushing down. So we're going to have a quick look at that clip. So here's the clip of that amazing cheetah sighting with a leopard. I was so excited during this the sighting. It was absolutely incredible. And we just noticed those cheetah around the termite mound and then the round leaf teak just behind there. Unfortunately, we tried our best to get both the cheetah and the leopard in the in the same frame, but as that leopard charged off towards they made long ways. So you you you're not you're sure it wasn't your incompetent driving? No, I'm quite sure it wasn't my uh, incompetent driving. <laughs> um, I must just tell you that uh, Brent arrived home that day uh, <laughs> playing a uh, thunderstruck by ACDC <laughs> and basically behaving like he was. Uh, a rock star That's, because I, I had like found mongoose poo and he had found a cheetah being chased by a leopard. I did feel like a rock star but moving on to a lot slightly more serious we have got a question from Deb in Ohio. Um, hi Deb welcome to the fireside chat. Uh, Deb would like would like to know what is the purpose of the black stains around a cheetah's eye and since I had such a fantastic sighting I'll let James at least talk about cheetah. That, everybody, is known as dropping someone in it. <laughs> um, the black tear marks on a cheetah are probably most likely from um, the... Well, pro most probably there to absorb light. Remember that a cheetah is the only nocturnally, at least diurnally, hunting cat, and it's exposed to huge amounts of sunlight, especially where it is often living in places like the Namib Desert, where there's huge reflection of the, of the sand, and so we think, and I mean this is postulation, that uh, the black tear marks on a cheetah um, absorb some of that reflected light, a little bit like um, if you watch some of NFL players playing uh, uh, under lights, They'll put black boot polish under their eyes. Uh, there's a famous uh, West Indian cricket player called Shivnarin Chandapal who does the same thing. And it's apparently to reduce the amount of light that reflects into the eyes, especially when you look up. So we think that's why the cheetah have the tear marks in their eyes. Well, Dave, next question. Thanks very much for that, yeah. chance. Uh, Dave would like to know, um, what is the size difference between a cheetah and a leopard? And if they were to fight, who would be the victor? Yeah. Oh, so it always comes down to who's going to win. It always comes down to who's going to win. So basically, Dave, um, the cheetah, even though they might look sometimes bigger, they are quite a lot, a lot taller, but they are very slenderly built. And even a young male leopard like Quarantine is physically a lot stronger and has a lot more muscle mass. So a cheetah, I think the heaviest recorded male cheetah in the wild is just over 60 kilograms and yeah. the heaviest recorded male leopard in the wild is 94 kilograms. So there is quite a big weight difference even though the cheetah is quite a bit taller. And if it came down to who had to win, even one leopard against two cheetah, I think my money would be on the single male leopard. The other thing to remember, it's a little bit like um, pitting a Kenyan marathon runner um, <laughs> against uh, somebody of the same height, say, who was a boxer. Um, a leopard is based So it's just a totally different design. Thanks very much, James. Yes, um, I do we that. have uh, another question from Ron in Scotland. Uh, Ron would like to know what are the main 
uh, sort of focuses on the conservation effort uh, on cheetah in South Africa to do with the meta population. For those of you not sure what a meta population is, it is the whole population itself. So not the le the, the cheetah from Kruger or the cheetah from um, the Karoo, it is the whole population looking over it. Um, and actually, Ron, I actually, because of that cheetah sighting, went and did quite a bit of reading on the meta population. And I was lucky enough that my dad actually went to one of the meta populations meetings and forwarded on a really interesting article about that. Um, so, Ron, basically, the biggest problem with cheetah is genetics. Um, and this is partly our fault in the in, in the last couple of years, but generally it is actually, cheetah hit a genetic bottleneck about 10,000 years ago, and cheetah are, almost all cheetah in the world, whether it be even the Arabian cheetah or a cheetah that is in the Kalahari Desert, is almost genetically the same. So there's a very small genetic pool which makes them very, very prone to diseases. And a disease, um, and that the problem with that is that there's no genetic difference, so there's not uh oh sorry i'm getting a bit tongue-tied here there's no members of the population who have an immunity to that disease so when the disease does get into a population it is very very difficult um to stop and the, a lot of the animals die there was a case in a zoo uh, in the u.s that they lost 60 percent of their cheetahs in a week to this disease so the main conservation effort from what i've been reading is to try and ensure people are not inbreeding them further in smaller reserves especially in the fenced reserves and make sure when they do have to move cheetah they're moving the most genetically distinct cheetah, uh, cheetah from a reserve to another reserve. Ron, what they also do especially in places like Namibia they're working extensively with farmers. Um, cheetah actually thrive very well outside of conservation areas if they're not harassed and so they're working extensively with farmers specifically in Namibia where there's huge space there are only two million people in the whole of Namibia and it's a massive massive country and they're working with farmers to sort of compensate them for stock losses in order to stop them um, killing cheetah because a uh, cheetah will go in and if they can take a goat um, instead of a, a springbok which runs at 90 miles an hour then that's what they're going to do um, but the cost of uh, cheetah conservation and trying to catch cheetah is far less than the odd goat every few weeks and so they're working hugely with the farmers outside of protected areas in places like Namibia just to to allow sort of free roaming cheetah and the big thing with cheetahs is that they don't they're not a threat to human beings and Aleutian sheepdogs is also another interesting yeah um, that's being in Namibia using a, a Spanish uh, sheepdog that is very big and uh, actually protects the flock like it's one of its own uh, to try to push the That's cheetahs right, away. Yeah. But um, guys, moving on to the next really exciting yes, exciting of the week, and that was James. Yes, I was very jealous. Um, Andrew, while we were driving home one fairly uh, tired uh, uh, morning, it was quite warm, and Andrew um, managed to, he just shouted, Badger! I slammed on the anchors, Andrew fell forward and knocked his two front teeth out, but we didn't worry about that. Cameraman and asked. there was a female badger and her little pup. And it was such a special thing to be able to see, because we I've never seen one here before. They're very seldom seen in the Sabi sands, they're normally completely nocturnal. And there was this little baby and its mother digging, fossicking around in the ground in the bottom of this drainage line um, trying to find something nice to eat and it was just the most it was a most amazing thing just to be even to to be able to film them and capture them in the wild like that was spectacular and um, just to mention both these sightings of this week are so rare in the wild earth history there have been only a handful of a um, handful of is comes from a different sort of super family so they are um, they're as closely related say um, as jackals uh, no they're not they're as closely related as well let's give an example as mongoose are to um, to perhaps genets and viverids and and so they they're not quite they're the same super family but not the same family so they're actually quite distantly related um, and 
The one thing that they do do that's very similar to skunks, and the reason I think that the confusion comes is that a honey badger has an extremely powerful and pungent <laughs> anal gland, and they use that at a moment's notice if they feel threatened uh, they will spray you they will spray plants they will spray anything that comes after them uh, with this really foul smelling stuff much in the same way as a skunk does so um, James in Kansas would like to know whether honey badgers have one particular den that they utilize or do they move around between uh, other dens now I don't want to drop you in it again James but it is your sighting <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, badgers do not have specific dens, except, I suspect, when they have youngsters. And you jump in here if you feel I'm talking nonsense. Um, so when that little pup that we saw uh, is about that big now, and I think probably not in a permanent den anymore, when they're very tiny, what they will do is uh, dig, almost always go into a termite mound that has been excavated by an art fark or ant bear and they'll birth the babies there they birth they're born blind they're totally altricial so they're they're totally helpless um, as soon as they're old enough they'll move from the den and they probably do move around um, she probably might uh, carry them to different dens the pups because these dens start to smell quite offensive after a while and um, gets lots of ectoparasites yes there's plenty of parasites uh, from the dung and all the kind of disease that goes with uh, living in a small hole and so she'll move them around but I don't think that they, those ones specifically had a would have had a specific den no I mean, they've already been roaming home range yeah. by that stage yeah. 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 Uh, shall we have a look at the clip? I think so. Most right, definitely. We're going to have a look at the clip of the of the badgers, and here we go. Well done, Andrew. Lovely stuff from you. You're a, a, something of a genius behind the camera. Uh, Brent thought that that badger had caught a frog. Um, they will eat frogs, obviously, a lot, and I'm really not sure um, whether that was a frog or not. Uh, I couldn't see. That made a loud crunch noise uh, which was uh, fairly unattractive once it was eaten and you'll also see the little one running with its tail up now that's a sort of defensive mechanism and they will be they run with the tail up like that in case they need to spray that foul smelling anal gland and and that's why they run like that you'll notice that the female wasn't nearly as threatened as the male as that as the little one was so the little one ran with the tail up and the female didn't but still in it really really special sighting but moving on to father's day yeah we have a, a question from carrie in texas hi carrie um carrie are we are just going to finish looking at the kip i was a bit i was a, a bit premature there sorry about that carrie so carrie would uh, would like to know um if our f we have any particular stories about our fathers that might have ignited our passion for the bush um, I actually do have a story about my father that was ignited my passion, well, sort of ignited my passion for the bush. Um, we were not a family of uh, great bush people. Uh, we didn't have a caravan. We didn't have any tents. In fact, I can safely tell you that my mother has not spent a night under canvas in her life, <laughs> and she never will. Uh, my sister, the thought to the, my sister, the thought of camping is totally offensive, and my brother works in a bank, so that's really my family. But we did used to travel to the bush every so often. And I remember my dad and I, I think I was 12 and I don't know how old he was. Um, we went, came down to a farm not far from here called Giraffe Farm in the Tim Timbavati. And we went off walking, just the two of us, one afternoon after everyone else had had a big lunch and gone to sleep. And I didn't want to sleep and my dad didn't want to sleep. And we just went for a walk in the bush. And I mean, it was probably quite dangerous because <laughs> we were clueless. And I mean, when I arrived in the bush later to be a guide, I was totally clueless. But we found a huge baobab tree, just the two of us, um, in the, and one of the southernmost baobab trees in the world. And I climbed the tree, and it was with my dad below it, and he climbed up after me, and it has remained one of the most special memories of my life. And I, I remember moving, when I moved to Ngala, which is just next door to the farm where that baobab was, I remember driving past the exactly exact same tree on my way to, to the gate one day, and just feeling, getting a tremendous pang in my heart at how um, the memory of, of my father and I walking through the bush that day had just meant so much to me. So that's my, 
my Bush and Dad story. Mm. With me and the where I grew up, I, I have quite a few Bush and Dad stories. Yes. Um, but probably it's one of my youngest memories in the bush. And it's very strange how you can remember some stuff from when you were very, very young. Um, I was probably not much over two, over two years old. Um, and we were in northern Botswana. And um, with the, my parents and the, who they were camping with stopped for a, a sundowner. And me being me, with my attention deficit disorder, meandered off. And they lost me. And my dad came round to this big pan and had a little bit of dry, very similar to what the water holes are at the moment, a little bit of mud, and there I was, this big, standing about 10 meters away from a huge elephant bull. <laughs> and all I can remember is my dad sort of running up, and I was having a chat to the elephant in, in baby language, and he ran up and just shoop, under the arm <laughs> and kept going round back towards the vehicles. But um, In case you haven't noticed, Brent likes to have a chat generally. Yes, all the time, even came, with elephants. Came from an early age. Yes. What a but wonderful story. No, it was, it was, it was, and it's strange, it's my youngest, it's my earliest memory. And I can't oh. remember a lot of stuff after that, yeah. but that's my earliest memory as a kid. <laughs> but so, enough with uh, dad stories, I think it is time for you to we start explaining um, what we're going to be doing next. Uh, well, we're going to have a small song, uh, a great song. Uh, the great song that we're going to sing um, I see I've done a few of these uh, Johnny Clegg numbers um, and this song uh, some of you have actually requested uh, and I was looking for a song e either about uh, dads um, I, but I couldn't find anything it wasn't miserable or <laughs> about um, or about winter and likewise I couldn't find anything that wasn't miserable I was practicing one by sting earlier today and it made me cry, so I thought that wasn't a good idea. And so, in keeping with um, that sort of Baobab story, and I'm sure many of the stories you have, um, there's a song called Great Heart by Johnny Clegg. And it's just a wonderful song about, it, it, it captured the hearts and minds of South Africans in the 80s uh, during the movie Jock of the Bushveld. And if you haven't seen it, go and find it somewhere. Amazing. And the first version, it was made in sort of 1985 or so. Six, I think. And this song was all about the low felt and whenever I hear it I think about that time my father and I in the baobab tree and Ooh, um, we've, we've okay. Brent is um, Brent will be on the egg today. <laughs> he, he's graduated. James, James uh, has given me a toy. So he will now be uh, on an the instrument. Egg. Please excuse the excuse the percussive uh, abilities of Brent as is his first try. <laughs> and I am not sure so Great Heart by Johnny Clegg. Full of strange behavior Every man has to be his own savior I know I can make it on my own if I try But I'm searching for a great heart to stand me by Underneath the African sky A great heart to stand me by I'm searching for the spirit of the great heart Hold and stand me by hey, I'm searching for the spirit of the great heart Under African skies Sometimes I feel that you really know me Give a bit of a shake Sometimes there's so much you can show me Not too fast Let's <laughs> take a ride there's a highway of stars across the heavens A whispering song of the wind in the grass A roaring thunder across the savannas A hope and a dream at the edge of the skies And your life is a story like the wind Your life is a story like the wind I'm searching for the Oh, and stand me by I'm searching for the spirit of the great heart That can beat the mind name inside Sometimes I feel that Oh, 
Sim Bass, I love when she see you. I'm a searching for the spirit of the graveyard. Who comes in Bass, I love when she see you. Only good. No, <laughs> it's terrible. Right, that music um, wasn't my just strong Just quickly, point. The, uh, I just wanted to tell you the Zulu part of that song, Guka Mzimba, Sala Wenchli Zio, means grow old, my body, but stay young, my heart. And I think our, both of our fathers have managed to do that to a certain extent. And uh, so that's for you, dads, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my dad in Eastern Cape and yours in the... On Dubis. Game Drive. <laughs> on Game Drive. Yes. Yeah, he's definitely Very still on nice. Game Drive. <laughs> Super. <laughs> so that was a, it was a wonderful week. Um, Absolutely badges, splendid. Cheaters. Cheaters. I got to play a musical Did instrument for the first time in my life. At school instrument. they used to kick me out of the choir immediately. Yes, yes I'm not entirely surprised. Your, per <laughs> your percussion is, is pretty talented, I feel. No, no. Yes. I think the dancing was better than yeah. that. No, we're mm. going to have to see what Scott can do when Absolutely, he gets back. Yes, no, it's going to be very interesting. That sort of stuff. <laughs> Anyway, so we'll see what the week, new week ahead holds to us. And as I said to some of you on Game Drive today, um, for us, Sunday is any other day, as it is for the Lions. So while we tend to, uh, in the cities, tend to spend our Sundays having a bit of a relax, uh, the Lions obviously do that every day, and we just go out kind of randomly. Brent, in fact, said, what are we doing for the fireside chat yesterday, uh, thinking that yesterday was Sunday, but yes, it is in fact today. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday, it's pretty much all the same for us, Archer. Yes. And we're very lucky to be able to do something that we yeah. love so much that it actually almost didn't mm. work after yeah. all. But we love going out there, we love sharing what we know with mm. you guys and being able to spend our time amongst nature. If it, is the, uh, if it is still Sunday wherever you are in the world uh, and you're in the Northern Hemisphere, I hope that you enjoy the longest day. Yes. Um, and if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, in Australia, you're probably already the other side of winter, which is quite nice for you. We will be there tomorrow morning and those in Argentina and beyond uh, will get there just a bit after us. And maybe nice. England, England might actually have some sunshine. Um, yes, it's unlikely. Likely though. No, no. grey, rain. Three, three days of summer, I think they get. Yes. Don't they? It's a bit like yes. Cape Town. Only, 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 only over Wimbledon though. Yes. 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 They allowed summer over Wimbledon. They allowed a few, few days of summer over Wimbledon. So I hope you enjoy that. So the week for us, I think, is going to hold a lot more uh, lions and uh, leopards. Hopefully. I'm very interested in the Kuhuma Pride and what happened with them today. Their blood was up when we found them this morning. They were nervous. Uh, they were staring into my eyes which kind of boiled my soul slightly and and you heard Brent that they had killed something south of the boundary just south of the boundary and I think maybe those Matimbas came yeah. in and chased them off I think that's what happened and what are they not on the boundary of the Styx Pride territory? they are very much so yeah. and the Styx females have been scent marking all the way up almost to Gary Dam yeah. so yeah. I think there's a bit of movement so going I, on I think that's what happened so those lions that we saw this morning and the same ones we eventually found this afternoon I think it had a bit of a territorial dispute and that's why their blood was up they'd eaten um, they'd had a fight over the food they were a bit damaged they're a bit injured um, but so they made it through it but anyway, um, it's been wonderful having you with us. We really have enjoyed this fireside chat, even the impromptu dance. I think that is actually dropping someone yes. in it. Yes, that is known <laughs> as dropping someone in it. Yes, yeah. well, thank yeah. you very much, James. Yeah. Well, from all of us here, have a wonderful evening. Um, from everyone behind the scenes you can't see, big thank you to all of them. And thank you to all of you for joining us. And we will see you bright and early for the Sunrise On the Safari. Morning. On the morning, yes. I'm a passion for the spirit of the great Lord. I'm a passion for the spirit of the great Lord. I'm a passion for the spirit of the great Lord.